Hey, what is going on, Military German? In this video, we are talking again with my good friend, AT2, Tony Michael, and he's going to be sharing with us what it's like being at your first unit as an AT and what you can expect uh, just the regular work life. So with all that being said, let's roll into the conversation. Now, uh, going back to when you get to your first unit, what is it like being uh, a new, uh, a newly um, made AT3 at an air station? You're lost. You're lost, man. It's, and that's kind of the adventure of it is figuring out where you belong and where you can position yourself to help. Um, I have a, I don't say it's a problem. I like doing a lot. I like being the go-to guy. I like, um, I'm a little outlandish. I have a pretty, uh, pretty uh, colorful personality. And I kind of didn't fit in when I first got to my unit because they kind of, they just, so it, Atlantic City um, is different because it's an all 65 unit and they have a line crew. They have a dedicated line crew shack. So line crew is fueling, towing, and washing of aircraft throughout the day, right? That's a cool place to start. But once you're there for a week or two, you're like, man, this is old. I want to, when do I get to actually do what I went to A school for, right? This is kind of like janitorial type stuff. Be patient. It all comes with good time. And, and, and you kind of, there's a little bit of a, and not all units have dedicated line crew, by the way. Some, some units, you just go right to the shop, which is, I think is pretty crazy because you don't know anything about that aircraft, man, which is kind of cool too, because you get to, you get to, you're in it and then you're, you're learning like day one. You're like, oh crap, this is, this is landing gear. All right. And then you're, you know, shop meetings in the morning, you're like, Hey, we got to troubleshoot this, this problem. And they'll say, Hey, Tony, go with, you know, so-and-so I know you're new, but go learn. That's cool. Like, that's really cool. I've seen that before. And I, I kind of envious of that. So that, um, it just depends on what unit you go to on how exposed you are as soon as you get there, but you're going to hit the ground running. It's not a, it's not a, it's not like a kind of gravy process where you just kind of run with it you know so the, the the first thing that you're doing is you're you're shadowing other people and you're learning uh how to troubleshoot um about how long does it take until you're qualified to be able to start doing things on your own or is that just experience based so that's up to the the uppers in the shop so your first class and your second classes if you're and like i said earlier if you're that guy that's figuring stuff out you're hard charging you're in the books you're figuring out system you're learning system knowledge you're learning how to write stuff up in almis which is our computer tracking program for maintenance discrepancies on aircraft then they're gonna they're gonna try to pick you and, and, and try to get you more exposed to um to bigger and better things right um there is the monotony of the same troubleshooting that comes up almost every day but um I think the the more uh, you show that yourself you're a go getter and you want to learn, they'll put you in positions where you're forced to learn. So, wh how much of the job? So, wh what's a typical day, or what, what would be the next thing? So, you're you're troubleshooting, but you also said that you're also on the helos and you're you're you have other types of qualifications. What are the other types of responsibilities that ATs have? Yeah, so um, right out of the gate, you're not flying. Right. And it, it was kind of sad thinking about it that way because I was like, man, I'm ready to fly. I'm ready to get on this helicopter and go do stuff and, and see around. You'll get your your familiarization flight. Right. So they'll take you up on a flight. They'll show you the, the general area of where the um, where the air station is. And then that's it. That's your one and done for at least three months because you need to have basic system knowledge to become a, an air crew member because you don't want to have somebody that doesn't know about the helicopter be in the back backing up the pilots for systems that you don't know anything about. You know what I mean? So there's a there's a certain like threshold where you where you start learning about the aircraft. So I would say month one is going to be getting all your ground your ground items done. Um, you're going to learn how to tow the aircraft, fuel it, wash it, why it's important to wash it, do fuel samples, stuff like that, right? And then as you roll into month two and month three, you'll start working on your um, your post flight items, or probably month two, you'll probably start working on your post flight items. So your post flight items is when we're putting the aircraft away for the night. They've already completed all their flights. They're coming back, and um, now you have to perform a visual inspection of the aircraft to make sure there's nothing wrong with it, or maybe any f uh, foreign objects have gotten into certain spaces that they're not allowed to be. Right. 
So that's your post-flight qualification. After that, then you can start working on your BA, your basic aircrew ground stuff, in which you have, I think it's eight ba- eight, eight syllabi, if you will, so eight different sign-offs. So you'll have power plant, you'll have rotary, you'll have uh, you know electronics. It just continually breaks down the aircraft and system knowledge base, right? After that, you move into the flight portion of that um, qualification, basic aircrew, where you'll do four or two or three flights. I think it's three flights. Your first two um, syllabi are ground items where you'll um, you'll talk about the aircraft to a uh, an instructor to sign to to do it to standard like a PQS almost. And then, um, and then the second por- portion of that is knowing all your emergency procedures. So what happens if we have an engine, uh, an engine fire in flight, you have to know how to, how to, it just has to be by memory. Like you have to be able to nail it right after that, you go into your flight portion and then you have three flights. And so once you, you're finished with all of these other steps and you get that, so that flight portion, uh, when do you get to start? Is, is there anything after that or, or yeah. is that kind of the end of it? So once you finish your BA, um, you, you're considered a basic air crewman. You'll get your wings, your gold wings. They look pretty freaking baller on your ODU because the more gold, the better, right? Um, and then I would say roughly anywhere from six months to a year of flying, then they'll start working you into the flight mechanic syllabus. Now, the flight mechanic syllabus is a whole different animal. This is where you kind of have to step out of your comfort zone, at least for, for rotary wing. I can't speak on the behalf of, of fixed wing, but at least for a rotary wing, right? So um, it gets it gets kind of crazy. I'm not going to lie. It, it, you, you're hanging out of a helicopter 15 feet above the ocean. That's not normal. You know what I mean? And you have a swimmer on the hook, uh, another person's life on, on the end of a, a cable that's running down to the ocean. That's not normal. And it's really cool, and it's a really cool sensation once you get into that that phase of your um, qualification. So, the first um, it's eleven flights, and the first portion of your 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 flight mix syllabus is your ground stuff. So you'll do all the standard hoisting procedures. You'll learn the conning commands. You'll learn the standard phraseology of what to say, when to say it, how often you should be talking how to con the pilot and position the helicopter in a, in, a, in a way that you can pick up or put down the swimmer, rescue devices, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then you move into your hoisting portion where you hoist on the ramp. So there's a certain area on the, on the, on the runway or at the airport that you'll work at where you'll hoist down to the earth to the line crew members where you used to be and they'll tend the lines for you and, and that's where you start knocking off the rust and learning how the conning commands work in conjunction with pilot movement and how to operate the hoist system and all that stuff. That's the fun part. The crazy part is when you first get out to the ocean on your first boat hoist, which I believe is, is flight mech four, there's 12 syllabi uh, or flights in that, that qualification. So your first um, hoisting flight to a boat in the ocean was ridiculous, man. I was like, it was crazy. I couldn't believe this was actually happening. Like you see it on, on TV and, and you know, you, you watch these search and rescue missions and, and when you're actually like put in that position, you're like, Holy cow, like this is actually happening. This is cool as hell. And then, and then you're like, Oh wait, I gotta, I gotta hoist. Like you get, you get back into it. And uh, that's happened to me a couple of times where it's kind of almost surreal. You're like, Holy cow, this is like super cool. Right. And I, especially on your first, uh, my first live hoist that I had, um, Back in October, I saved a guy's life off of a, uh, a Royal Caribbean cruise ship um, 120 miles offshore at sea at night and no moon illumination. So the, the sea meets the sky. There is no um, artificial horizon displacement. So um, I saved a guy's life. Um, he had a stroke. He was a stroke patient. We did a 100-foot hover, picked him up off the cruise ship and brought him back. We saved his life. So all that training... And all the syllabi and the sign-offs and the flights and everything that you learn, it all comes together in that one moment. And you're like, I can do this. You know, you, you save the guy's life. And that's what ultimately we, we came in for, at least if you're going rotary, 
um, that's what you want it to do. So it's really rewarding, man. And and how long does it take for you to be able to get to that point where you're you're doing the hoist and saving, being able to save people's lives on missions? I would say anywhere from a year to two years after you get to your first unit. A year Just to- because it, it's such it's such a it's such a knowledge based. Um, uh, qualification where you have like the pilots depend on you to know what to do, when to do it, how to do it, what you have to say while you're doing it. You know what I mean? Like it's not, it's not like, Hey, go change this out. It's you're in charge of, you're the third voice in the aircraft. Something's going wrong. You need to tell the pilots what's happening or especially with hoisting. I mean, when you have a swimmer on the other end of the hook and you're locking up because you don't know how to uh, say something a certain way and you end up hitting the, the swimmer against the side of a boat and hurting them, that's on you. So they want to, they really want to make sure that you're mentally prepared and, and, and knowledge based prepared to put you in a position to where you're able to do something like that. So what I would say roughly any, it depends on how you progress too. And like I said, this is very important when you get to your unit because you want to be a hard charger. You want to show them that, Hey, I'm your guy. I want to do everything. I want to be involved. I want to get to where I'm going as quick as possible. So that for me, I I was a flight mechanic within the first year of getting maybe like a year, year and a half after getting my unit. Some people take as long as two years to get to get flight mech qualified. So it's completely up to you. Now, the, the big thing is uh, when people think of AMTs, typically they think of like the hoisting. Um, but I, I think that there's maybe a false image in the Coast Guard and, you know, just for, for people that are coming in that, you know, the things that you're talking about, those are the th- same things that, you know, we typically think like the AMT is the guy yeah. on the hoist, the AST is the guys in the water, the a- ATs are the guys that are somewhere else doing something other than what the mission is but um yeah, what's yeah. what what is the real difference between AT and AMT none the only thing the only difference is on the ground is is what you do as a as a job on a daily activity um i can hoist just like a mech can and a mech can hoist just like i can we share the same calls in the air and the same responsibilities it's when we get back to the the hangar and we're working on aircraft which really defies what what rate we're actually in so Dude. there's there is a, and it, it's kind of crazy that you mentioned that because I did hear that on my way to A school. I was like, man, if I become an AT, I'm never going to be at a hoist and I can't do any of that. That is absolutely false. 100% untrue. Any AT or AMT can become a flight mechanic. Do the AMTs get to hoist more than the ATs or is it, are you guys no. on the same schedule? It is literally per duty section, same schedule. You, I mean, I could call up my watch captain. I have duty Sunday and I say, I want to hoist. I'm hoisting that day. You know what I mean? It's when you want to do it. And it's not about if you're a mech or a tweet. It's the same thing. Now, what is, what is the daily life like of an AET? Like, what do you, what do you, are you, is every day going out hoisting and doing all these things? Or what, what is the daily life like? Yeah, so, I mean, um, it depends on your unit for your report time. But essentially, you get in, you have your, you have your, coffee which is very important especially in my daily routine um and then uh you'll have a morning brief where you'll sit down with the shop their your chief or your your first class whoever's running the shop that day will give you uh pretty much an out uh, an outline of what needs to be done that day what kind of troubleshooting discrepancies we have or what kind of maintenance packages we have and stuff like that um as far as flying and hoisting um that happens as often as you want it to happen and as and as little as you want it to happen. So if you if you love hoisting, so they kind of save the the, the regular flights for the the new members coming out of A school that they haven't really had to had time to experience that. They want to give those flights to them because that's how be, they become knowledgeable and they build their their um, their risk tolerance or their their tolerance up for aircraft. And maybe people get a little bit of air sick or whatever. I've never I've run into that maybe once or twice on really really windy days. And if I'm looking out and not not out the window, but they want to give flight time to people who are new. So if you want to fly, you're going to fly. Now in my position, I've been in for eight years. I've been a tweet for almost five years. I'm, I'm, I'm to that point where I'm like, all right, you know, I'm getting a little bit older. I may, may or may not feel it. (laughs) You know, I feel like flying today. If, uh, if AT3, whoever wants to go fly, they can take my flight. Depends on what, what you want to do now on your duty days. Um, which I generally have duty every, you know, probably three to four times a month. You're going to fly on those days. Um, you're going to hoist, 
and uh, and it's fun. You you look forward to those days because um, when you get up to you know second class and first class, you don't really hoist that often. It generally goes to the to the newer members, like I was saying earlier, to build up their knowledge. Um, so it all depends on how much you want to fly. But going back to the the average work day, so um, you know you got your your morning brief, and then you'll break off um, either in teams of two or maybe singular. Um, any tackle either um, uh, like a the discrepancy on an aircraft electrical discrepancy or, or uh, maybe like a troubleshooting uh, maybe there's uh, you know a certain issue with an aircraft that we need to figure out or you'll go and do scheduled maintenance which is the the NPCs that are you know calendar 30 every 30 days 60 90 days whatever yes. and then after that's complete um, it's generally a six-hour work day I don't know how other units are we come in and uh, we start working at eight and we go home at two, um, which is awesome. And we'll get into that later. Um, and then, uh, you know, you have a, sh a shop brief at like one forty-five in the afternoon. That's every, every pretty much at one o'clock you're cleaning up. Um, you know, you're, you're signing all your stuff off in uh, all miss, you know, making sure your discrepancies are completed. Um, you get your quality assurance um, stamps in your cards and you turn those in. And in 145, you're having your shop brief, which basically outlines like maybe shows a little insight of what we have tomorrow. And then, you know, maybe gain a little bit more insight of what we could accomplish today as far as troubleshooting and maintenance and stuff like that. So, And and that schedule is is entirely dependent unit on unit based off of um, so where, where you guys are could be different somewhere else, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to Miami and their work schedule is a little bit different. So um, everyone needs to be in a 715. Um, ready to work instead of eight and uh they work till two two thirty three it just depends on to be open-minded because if there's a lot of maintenance that needs to be done and there's not enough aircraft to support the mission you're going to probably stay late and it doesn't happen often but when it does you know it, it it is what it is you know it's part of any it's part of the job what what is it like you know being an AT in one unit versus an AT in another unit? are you? Do you have different responsibilities now that you're a second? Is it going to be any different than when you were, you know, um, you know, being a third that's been at a unit for a long time? Yes and no. Um, me becoming an E5 slides me more into a, a of a project manager, manager, like supervisory role. But at small units, everyone is equal. The, f the only people that don't really get out and get dirty with you are the, f are the chiefs in the first class, right? So I, I've gained knowledge from E4s that knew just a little bit more about, you know, basic electrical theory than I did, right? And I, you know, obviously I'm in a position to where I, I can teach E4s now what I, what I do and help them along like somebody helped me along. Um, going to Miami, I'm going to be put more of in a uh, – a, a worker um, uh, position more so than I was um, in AC when I did make E5, but it's kind of hard to judge because I made E5 March 1st and then we had a global pandemic <laughs> and now we're all on work, alternate work schedules and I only work every four days now. And it's, it's generally come in, get the job done and go home. So everyone's kind of working together to, to, to complete the goal. Do the do the ATs and the AMTs? Um, is it is it kind of like high school? You guys are separate. You only hang out with your certain crews, or what's the what's the yeah. what's the life like for an AT with a ASTs, AMTs, and everybody else? It, it's kind of crazy, man. Because I didn't think it. So maybe it's just different at my unit because we do have our own individual shops. So like the swimmers have their shop, the mechs have their shop, ATs have their shop, right? And you don't really go into those shops unless you need something. Or, you know, you have something to tell some somebody or whatever, right? But that's an AC. So, and this is a good perspective for both angles. I'm glad I'm on your podcast. I'm going to Miami and now everyone's in one big shop and we all work together. So Max will be doing tweet stuff. Tweets will be doing Max stuff. More so tweets be doing Max stuff. But we all work together and, and it, it's coming together. There's a common goal. Get the aircraft up or perform the maintenance and then go home. But as far as like personalities, like do you hang out with other people from uh, different types of ratings or you only really kind of hang out with the people in your, your rating? So you're not bound. Um, I think the stereotype is 
it's it, you leave everything at work. It doesn't really matter if you're a tweeter or a mech or a swimmer outside of work. Um, I'm sure work stories will come up. Um, I'm kind of a homebody and I'm usually too busy to, to, to generally hang out. You know what I mean? Um, at work it's, you know, you work alongside everybody. So it, it, it everyone's kind of just mixed in together. Now, whether or not you want to hang out with somebody outside of work is your, your prerogative. But um, like I said, we were separated at this unit, but I feel like it's going to be more of a different atmosphere once we get to, when I get to Miami where everyone's kind of mixed in together. What, what are, what are the, the types of people that you are working with? Are, is there a pretty big difference from uh, like ASTs and AMTs and ATs or like what type of person is, is going to be best fit for AT? Your AETs are going to be fit for your AETs. Um, generally, the mechs are too busy to even conversate, and the jobs that they're doing are not even in your your area of where you're going to be generally working. Um, as far as personality types, I do think that the mechs are kind of like, a, I'm going to swing this hammer, and, and the, the tweets are like, hey, let's figure this out together. You know what I mean? Like, It is a little bit different in that regard, but... I don't think it's 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 very it's like I don't think it's readily apparent. Um, you kind of have to be at a unit for a while to to understand that kind of um, mind disparity between the tweets and the mechs. Um, but somebody just reporting, they're not going to know who a mech or a tweet is. That's for sure. And hmm, what what else? Um, what do what's the what's the life cycle of or? What's the career path for an AET? Do ATs typically do 20 years? Do they get out? Um, what's the progression of, of an AT when they're coming in? So I'll go ahead and, and pedal back to the original con- or the beginning of the conversation where we asked why I went AET. I went AET because the skill set that you learn being an aircraft electronical technician, electrical technician, um, it really opens up doors for you outside in the civilian world. And I think we're starting to see that a little bit more that people are, are, are able to freelance to maybe better paying jobs on the outside. Um, I don't think it's, it depends on what type of job you're looking to and what, and what kind of lifestyle you're wanting to, if you're, if you're tired of moving or you, you don't want to be as regimented, you don't want to shave. We just got a no shave order. That's the only reason why I have a beard at my, at my air station. They said, look, if, don't shave if you don't want to shave. So I think it's all about what your career goals are. I do say, I will say in times like we are now, I'm grateful to have, a government job that's going to continue paying me no matter what Boeing aircraft or Boeing employees. And I'm just using them as an example. They're furloughed or not furloughed, but they're laid off right now. They're not working. I'm still getting paid. They're not, you know what I mean? So it depends on where you want to be, what your lifestyle is. And I may have a completely different perspective next year. Um, as I get further into real estate investing, I might be like, look, I, I, you know, I enjoy this a little bit more. I've done my time. I've done 10 years. I've saved people's lives. I came in to do exactly what I've done. I want to flip the next chapter in my life and continue on doing this. Right. What, so for a person that, that is though, because you said, um, being an AT, you're dealing with a lot of electricals, a lot of things like that. That's one of the things that people choose their rating for. A lot of the people that listen to this channel spe- uh, specifically, they're they're real goal oriented, future oriented. Um, yeah. When is there a big difference from people that can maybe um, get experience or things lined up for them from AT versus let's say AMT? Absolutely. Um, I think the 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 job in itself is vastly different from what a mech offers and i'll say that cautiously because everyone respects their own work in their own regard right um it's whether or not you want to continue learning and building your knowledge um i've already applied for my amp license just because i had enough maintenance hours and maintenance history to do so all i have to do is take a test and now i'm an amp that opens up a lot of doors on the outside so uh, i'll 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 segue into the 20 year term. So if you want to do 20 years, um, it's absolutely doable. You're going to continue. You're going to, you're going to slowly shift into more of a supervisory role 
as with every rate in the Coast Guard, once you get up the food chain, so as first class, you won't really be working on the hangar deck more, you know, as much. You'll be managing the shop and making sure people are doing their jobs and it, not micromanaging, but making sure stuff gets done, right? Um, and then as you make chief, obviously, you know what chiefs do. They drink coffee and do nothing. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, it, 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 uh, it all depends on what you want out of the military. I would say 20 years a good, a, a good, if you enjoy your jobs and that's, that's the whole goal behind it, right? You want to, you want to do something you're, you're happy about doing, right? You don't want to come in and, and that's why I said cautiously, like when you get to your first unit at a boot camp, don't listen to everybody. They're going to throw their projections on you. Like I am right now. I bet you want to become a tweet after I've done talk to you. Right. But a mech could come along and out talk me and say, next, the best thing in the world. It all depends on what you want. So having a non-biased opinion and maybe a general idea of where you want to be 20 years down the road will, will help you make a decision now. I, th- I think it's funny that you brought that up because I had uh, a friend uh, come on the show a while ago who was a fixed wing AMT. And I think that there's probably been a big influx of fixed wings AMTs in the Coast Guard now because it, it, he made it sound yeah. really, really cool. Um, yeah. You know, it sounded like a good gig. Um, yeah. But you know, talking with you, it's like it's a it's a totally different perspective, and that's that's yeah. why I like getting guys like you on. Um, but going back, so you said you know obviously doing a full twenty career, um, that's more like a supervisory position. You're not so much technical. Um, for is is what I want to know is is AT is the electronics more valuable of a skill set than let's say yes. an AMT? Yes. Yeah. One hundred percent over again. Yes. If you look at and I'm talking about the outside, right? If you look at the pay tables of an AMP mechanic versus a um, an avionics technician on you know aircraft, it's vastly different. And I'm talking anywhere from fifteen to forty five thousand dollars annually different. Um, and I'm not I'm not throwing shame on mechs, but more people can do a mech job than people can do tweet. Uh, I call, you'll learn the term tweet if you go AT. We're called tweets. Um, more people can do mech job more than, uh, and less people can do um, what avionics electric, electrical technicians can do. Just because it's it does require some sort of um, you have to think outside of the box sometimes. You know, if you look at something, it's not going to slap you in the face and say, "Hey, or, you know, fix me." Here I am. You got to get in there and and and, and understand your craft. And I think that's where a lot of people may um, stop on the train and just be like, look, I want something that's mindless. I want to come in, do my job and go home. I don't want extra thought to be, a, you know, I don't want there to be any extra thought. I want to have to think, I just point at something, replace it and I go home. Right. So if you're the type of person that likes doing a little bit more and figuring out difficult um, projects, then go AT. What what are the are there people that solicit um, or try to recruit AETs from the Coast Guard and what type of jobs do people that typically do get out um, what are they what are they typically picking up? It's so different, man. Because, and I'm just speaking generally right now. You could go work for Boeing or. Uh, Lockheed Martin or any one of those big companies, right? You can look, you can work for the airline industry as a, um, an electrical technician, or if you have enough experience in your boat, you could be pushed into a supervisory role, which exponentially raises your salary, right? Or you can jump into, um, rebuilding circuit cards for, um, CAT scan machines for hospitals, or it, it's once you have that base electrical knowledge, um, and the skill set that the A school taught you, and then you're able to build upon that as you're working on helicopters. I mean, it's basically who will who will accept you with your with your skill set. Um, yeah, that's the way I see it. And what, what was the other thing? Um, totally forgot what I was going to ask. Um, had a brain fart. No worries, man. No, but it, it is it is it's a rewarding rate, and um, I think I think people that choose this rate are a little bit more ambitious and a little bit uh, more driven to their craft than other people are. 
and that's just my personal experience and what I've what I've seen the past five years. Oh, um, so a lot of people want to be in aviation. Maybe they want to become a pilot. Uh, there's this uh, belief in the Coast Guard or this this rumor that if you go aviation, you're you're more um, there's a higher possibility of you becoming a pilot. Is that something that's true? Does it matter it if you're an AMT or an AT? Who are the types of people that typically do become pilots? So I would say you have a better chance of becoming a pilot as an AT than you do an AMT. And I only say that because we have more in-depth instrument knowledge than mechs do because they don't work with them, right? So the avionics components on an aircraft are, are vital to what a pilot needs to know especially navigating an aircraft in, 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 in flight. Um, we, we understand all the instruments that the pilots use, um, on a, on a, on a blunt, like face up face value and an in-depth as uh, troubleshooting value. And it really does excel you in those, um, engineering classes in, in pilot training. Um, we have a AT to turn to a, a pilot Lieutenant, um, at our, at our unit. And it absolutely helps. And so you've seen more ATs turn pilot than AMTs? I've seen a swimmer turn pilot. So I'm not really sure if there's a correlation. I just know AV being prior aviation helps. And I, and I specifically know that AET helps not get you to aviation, but while you're, while you're, if you wanted to go aviation, AET would help you get into or become a pilot. AET would help you get there because, like I said before, you have instrument knowledge being an AET. You've been there. You've done that. Now, I've seen it. Like I said, I've seen a swimmer become a pilot, which is kind of crazy to me. I was like, holy crap, this guy's awesome. He's super down to earth. He's, he was a prior swimmer. For, he made an E6 and then went over to be uh, become a pilot. It's on how bad you want it. But – have that aviation background will help you get into pilot pilot school. Uh, and what has been the most scary or challenging moment of your career so far? Holy cow. I'd say the scariest, most challenging moment was that search and rescue mission or medevac rather, um, where we went 120 miles offshore it was 25 foot, tw it was like 15 to 20 foot swells. It was 55 miles an hour, uh, mile an hour winds. And I had to hoist to the front of a cruise ship in, at night and save a guy's life. That was, that's where everything came to one place and was like, oh my God, this is crazy. You know what I mean? Um, and you get to, you'll get the jitters. When you hear the search and rescue mission alarm go off, you'll get the jitters. You'd be like, Oh God, you know, you kind of get that adrenaline bump and then you come back down. And then when you, once you're getting to the place where you're going to medevac, the adrenaline starts pumping again. You're like, Oh, and then, and then you're just like laser focused, man. Like, here's what I got to do. This is how I have to do it. And, and all the training comes together and, it, and it's, it's really cool. That was mentally probably one of the most, one of the most challenging things I've been through. Awesome. And do you have anything to share to people that are interested in becoming an AT? Any any uh, last words? If you could tell, if you could tell yourself something, or anybody that is interested, um, what what would that be? I would say I, if you listen to the podcast this far, good for you. I know it's really hard to listen to me speak. Um, I I would study a little bit more prior to A school. Um, and then I would also see, man, I had a good experience. There wasn't really much learning point. Try to, uh, try to be open to other people's, um, opinions and, uh, you have to, you have to be open-minded as far as working with other people and, and being able to adapt to different personality types because, um, maybe from the prior unit you were at before, maybe you only had a small pool of people that you worked with and you guys got along. Well, now you're on a hangar deck with 20, 40, 60 other individuals and you're working elbow to elbow with them. Take time to get to know people, open up. Um, I know that was kind of one of my issues when I got to my first unit or this unit, I was kind of like a turtle 
a little bit. I didn't really know where I was supposed to be. And I hate being, I hate being like that. Cause I have, I took the disc model personality test and I'm really, um, a leader and I couldn't, I couldn't lead. I couldn't, I wasn't in a position to lead. So I had to like refrain myself from saying the things I wanted to say. And, and even though I, if I was in a right mind or a wrong mind, you know, so I would just say, keep open-minded, um, adapt. I would say adapt. Awesome. If you're planning on joining the Coast Guard and you want to be connected with other people, other people that are preparing to go to boot camp, then you should join our Facebook group, the Coast Guard Boot Camp Preppers, to connect with other people in the military journeyman community. Go ahead and share tips and tricks. If there's anything that you are doing to be able to help study, then be sure to join that group.